one, Pat Flynn. Welcome to Pints with Aquinas. It is a pleasure to be here, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm super glad to have you on. I'm looking forward to introducing my listeners and viewers to you and to learn more about your outgrowing of atheism and the journey that you took. Um, as we get started, I want to say hi to everybody who's here on the live stream. Please stick around. We're going to chat and Pat and I for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to be taking your questions. I'll be posting your questions to the video so that everybody can see, and uh, so you'll be part of this as well. And before you begin, you know what I'm going to say. Please hit subscribe and then that bell button because that actually does support the channel. Uh, give us a like, share us on Facebook, send me $1,000 and your firstborn child. And that'll be great. Hey, okay. So, Pat, how are you? I'm good, Matt. I'm doing really well. Sunny here in Wisconsin. Can't complain. Okay. And who are you and uh, what are you about? What do you, what, what's your thing? Right. What is my what is my thing? How do I how do I best describe myself? Well, I am Catholic now. I am anyways. I'm a I'm a writer. I'm an author. I publish fitness content. I have academic backgrounds in economics and philosophy. So I'm kind of a hodgepodge of things. I actually kind of describe myself as a generalist. And the theme of one of my latest books, which is humbly titled How to Be Better at Almost Everything, plays on the idea that in in today's world in today's economy i think especially for people like us matt who are content producers you might be better off trying to get good to great or at least fairly competent at a wide range of skills so that way you can stack those skills to form competitive and creative advantages in life so that's kind of that's kind of my thing if i have a thing and then you know when it comes to my content that allows me to talk about a lot of different stuff that i'm interested in from fitness to, to music writing, philosophy, theology, all that so sort of correct, stuff. Correct me if I'm wrong, you had a, a kind of fitness platform before you had come back to the Catholic Church, is that right? Right. So, yeah, interesting. I'll give the the brief synopsis there. I, I grew up the chubby kid out of all of my friends. Uh, eventually, I got, I got a little bit tired of that. So I took up martial arts in high school, Taekwondo. And the reason I picked that is because I was just probably a little too shy to go into the high school weight room. So I was looking for a sort of physical way to become physically cultured, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really got me into fitness. I had some great coaches, got me into weight training, and then specifically kettlebells. So if anybody is familiar with kettlebells, they're like the cannonball with a handle looking thing. And so as I'm going through college, part of the way, you know, part of the way I'm paying for my tuition is I, I just become a trainer and I'm training people. And I start blogging about it. I start creating YouTube videos. And this is back in the heyday of social media where you could still put up YouTube videos and tons of people would just kind of uh, see it from, from all over the world, which has pros and cons. Um, so when I was in college, that platform kind of grew. And it grew to the point where I got my, um, my first uh, book deal with, with Wiley. I was a For Dummies author for a while. Hmm. And uh, so even though I had nothing to do with my kind of formal academic background, that's where my career tended, and I've really just been doing that online fitness content primarily uh, ever since. Very cool, very cool. All right, well, so uh, I, I want to know just a little bit about your kind of um, religious background. Maybe just kind of sum this up real quickly, and then we'll dive into it in, in deeper. You know, how were you raised? What did you believe growing up? When did you convert? Right, so I was baptized Catholic, and I fell away from the faith quite early on. We can go into details. I then moved from agnosticism into uh, a, a fairly, I think, robust atheism. Um, that imploded on itself at some point, um, you know, kind of hit that nihilistic pit of despair, hmm. and then began to reconsider, reconsider worldview, and reconsider all the great philosophers and intellectual traditions that I sort of dismissed before. Mm -hmm. Eventually, that brought me to thinkers like Aquinas. That made me broadly a Thomist in my philosophy, and then that caused me to consider Christianity, which eventually led to me becoming, or re-becoming, I should say. Technically, I'm a revert, uh, Catholic. That's excellent. Okay, well, tell me how you right. went from you know being raised Catholic to agnosticism, because I, I I'm with you, and my journey was like that. I just sort of slid out of the faith because honestly, I looked around, no one seemed to be taking it that seriously. Everyone around me didn't really acted like they believed in God, and so I just kind of thought, well, God's just this thing that people tell themselves to comfort themselves, especially as they're ending, uh, nearing the end of life. So how did you become an agnostic? 
Right. Yeah. Very similar situation. Um, even though nobody in my immediate family would have declared themselves an atheist, th there was many practical atheists. They mm -hmm. lived as if they were atheists. So extremely nominal upbringing, no real catechesis, never had any serious religious questions answered for me, no positions explained, no defense, no teaching, none of that. So, you know, we would go to church occasionally. I even altar served for a little bit when I was mm -hmm. young, but that, that stopped pretty quickly. My, my parents got divorced, uh, and at, mm -hmm. at that point, kind of any religion in our life sort of fell away. Uh, but we weren't seriously involved even up to that point anyways. And I remember this, the kind of specific event, Matt. It was the same year that 9-11 happened when I really had my, my, my worldview, my faith at the time seriously challenged. I was sitting in my sixth grade uh, science class, and the teacher was sort of just kind of explaining the general sketches of modern cosmology and the Big Bang and, and all that. And I just remember having this sort of sinking, surprising feeling and thinking, like, this doesn't sound like – what I remember hearing about in first and second grade Sunday school, like this sounds radically different in many ways. Like where's Adam and Eve? There's no mention of an insidious snake or any of that stuff. Um, so that that was like the first serious seeds of doubt where I thought, well, maybe there's maybe there's something wrong with everything that I've been been taught growing up. Of course, I didn't. I didn't declare myself a full-blown atheist on the spot by any means, but that was, mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, the first crack in the shell, if you will, that would, you know, that would spread over time. And then I had many other influences. Um, I always loved writing and, and music. I've, you know, been playing music and, and writing since a very young age. So all the musical, inf I, I think we share a lot of the same musical uh, influences, Matt. Um, yeah. None of those guys seem to be super into religion either, yeah. right? Actually, it's, it's interesting because later on, some of my, my favorite bands, I, I realized that many of them did become Christian later yeah. on. Well, um, and, and also just to kind of put in here, because I know you might be talking about Metallica to some point, like James right, Hetfield, yeah. some of the things he's been saying of late, if he would have just said them when I was 15, I may have listened. I mean, he's, he's been saying some really profound things about virtue and living the good life and how sin is a waste of time. He doesn't use the word sin. Right. Well, even I would say Dave Mustaine, because Megadeth was a yeah. big influence for me. And I, I remember watching a video of him maybe a year or two ago where he talks about his conversion. And he, apparently, if I remember it right, he became convinced of the demonic in the whole metal scene. And because of that, became a Christian. I didn't realize and Dave Mustaine was a Christian. He is. He doesn't talk about it that much, but I think That's you can really find cool. some, some some interviews. And I'm fairly certain people will want to fact check me on this that Alice Cooper <laughs> yeah, no, is, Alice his Cooper. God, is, is his what? godfather. No. Is his godfather, right? Oh, so man. like you know, so these are my influences, but I had no idea about any of this. So far as I could tell, none of them took religion seriously. It seemed like a number of them mocked religion or even, mm. you know, made fun of it. So I wanted to be like these guys. And and they didn't seem to take it seriously. So so why should I, right? These were kind of my heroes. And then on the writing side, I, I always loved Mark Twain, had mm -hmm. a kind of early interest in him. Uh, he was always railing into religion. Um, he's, he's got many you know, pithy one-liners against religion. It's hard to say where he ended up religiously because he did finish with that book on Joan of Arc, which he said was the most exquisite person that he, he ever – thought of. So I feel like there was definitely a, a, a pulling of, of Mark Twain to the Catholic mm -hmm. Church, maybe towards the end of his life. But for most of it, it seemed like he didn't have a whole lot of uh, respect for religious traditions. And then Twain kind of passes me off to an old atheist um, named H.L. Mencken. And I mm. loved H.L. Mencken. And um, you see his kind of quotes floating around the, um, the internet sometimes. But I, I read him with a furious interest. And it's funny because he's got a lot of uh, kind of essays where you can see a lot of the the slogans that new atheists use. He was using those way back then, right? Um, so, and they were always a lot funnier when he did it. He's he, he's kind of like a Christopher Hitchens. He's hilarious. Can you, can you think he's, of any particular quotes? Well, he's got uh, an essay called I think it's if I remember right, it's called Memorial Service, and he's talking about the graveyard of the gods. So he's really just saying I just believe in one less god than all of you. All these other gods have gone to the graveyard. We might as well send the god of of christianity uh, there you. as yes. well so it's just it's just interesting to kind of trace a lot of these mm -hmm. slogans back in time and say okay it's there's not a whole lot of originality out there and it was probably even funnier when when mencken was saying it hmm. and it was I mean, he was hilarious I, I i just loved this guy as sort of a you know in high school he was very confident he had an incredible writing style um and he wrote one of the first books uh in english on friedrich nietzsche hmm. So he passed me off to Nietzsche, 
And then that's when I kind of just really took uh, a, a deep interest in philosophy as a whole. And one can imagine that once you kind of get caught up with the old atheists and existentialists, how they will color your worldview. So that was kind of the the world I was steeped in at the time, okay. and really just kind of coming at philosophy from that angle. So first. you would you say you were sort of an unintentional agnostic, at, at before you got more serious about it? Was it just something you kind of slipped into, and or was it something you spoke openly about to people who did believe? Yeah, no, I didn't have any sort of upfront animus with Christianity at all. It was yeah, it was a gradual, I would say, slipping into you know nobody. Like you, I noticed that people didn't seem to take their faith seriously. It seemed like there was a lot of hypocrites, but I was never um, – nobody ever seriously wronged me, you know, who was a Christian or a Catholic or anything like that. So I didn't have any uh, deep, um, you know, anger towards okay. religion or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So you say you began reading or being exposed to the existential philosophers. So tell me how you went from being an agnostic to deciding God doesn't exist. I presume that's what you mean by the term atheist. Right. So I know sometimes people will, um, the terms can be a little slippery, but when I use atheist, I, I mean, yeah, we're, we're affirming that God does not exist, right? Mm -hmm. And I would have considered myself really a naturalist for a while, a mm -hmm. physicalist, right? A materialist. Did you, did you have any arguments for that position? Um, none that I think rise a whole lot above the, the kind of standard cliches, right? That God is unnecessary or there's not, you know, all that good evidence for God or, or stuff like that. And what happened, Matt, is I started, as I started to try and dive deeper into the philosophy and see, well, is this a coherent worldview? Can we make sense of this? The more problems I started to encounter with it to the point that I kind of got to, uh, a sort of Rosenberg eliminativist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. position, right? Where I'm like, okay, if I'm going to really be an atheist in the great mechanistic tradition, and there's different flavors of atheism, right? There's some, there's some flavors of atheism that I really just call kind of theism light. Like they kind of bring teleology back in, they bring essences back in. But I was, I was interested in sort of the, yeah, the, the broadly physicalist mechanistic sort of worldview and I, I kind of, yeah, I kind of entered this d dilemma where I was like, okay, if I'm going to be consistent with this, it seems like it's going to be incoherent, All right? I'm going to have to go and deny certain aspects of reality that that can't really be coherently denied, like consciousness, like meaning, like intentionality, like the moral realm, for example. And these are, these are things you actually denied. You said eventually. Well, no, I got to a point where it seems like I'm going to have to deny these sure, things, sure. right? And and mm -hmm. and this is when I start having these kind of like deep, uh, re rebellious intuitions, like no, no, Pat, don't go, don't go here, right? Um, can, can, I just want to just want to pause a moment here, Pat. Sorry to cut you off, but just just no. to point out, you know, when we're kind of engaging with an atheist, we very quickly realize that it's not merely about having somebody change a proposition from God does not exist to God does exist. What you realize really quickly is that you're dealing with this entire philosophical matrix that undergirds their atheism. And it sounds like that's what you're saying, right? It's, it's like this materialism, nominalism, mechanicism, skepticism. And, and, and this is what's the soil out of which the new atheism grows. And I like that you're also being sort of intellectually consistent here, because I think some people would like to have their cake and eat it too, would like their atheism with their meaning, with their free will, etc. But it sounds like what you're saying is you realize those two couldn't go together? Yeah. So to the extent I was willing to be consistent, I think it's incoherent. To the extent that I wanted to keep it coherent, I don't think it could be consistent for exactly the reasons that, that you're talking about. And I think there are a number of uh, certainly more popular level atheists. And I do want to you know, draw the distinctions between the atheists that you kind of read, uh, again, and uh, the, the most prominent ones, and then those, you know, in the literature and philosophy of religion, often mm -hmm. very, very different in approach and attitude. Um, but, but yes, yeah, broadly that is that it's not, it's not like I, I would have just disagreed on one thing, one proposition. It's just a fundamentally different worldview yes, through yes. and through. Yes. Um, and that is really important. So for me, it's always, it, or at least, not, I shouldn't say it always, that's not true. It eventually really became a project of metaphysics, of ultimate, of ultimate understanding, seeking ultimate explanations, and realizing that one worldview was probably going to be either metaphysically absurd or at least seriously inadequate, right? And to the extent that it couldn't explain things, it would have to try and explain them away. 
Now, one of the mm. attractive aspects of, of atheism, and this is an attract, it was attractive to me, is that it's it's a very simple theory. It's a very lean theory, and we do want to um, acknowledge that simplicity is to be preferred, but not at the expense of explanatory power and depth. Right. So we can have simpler theories of history or or really anything. And we, but we can leave certain things out of those simpler theories. It just makes an explanatory mess of the entire project. My friend Tim McGrew gives the example of, well, you can have a theory of history that leaves out Abraham Lincoln, and that's all things considered leaner ontologically. Mm-hmm. But now you've just made a mess of the historical project, right? Oh, that's excellent. Spend some time elucidating that. That That's really profound. Right. So, I mean, replace Abraham Lincoln with teleology or essences when it comes to metaphysics. Yeah, you've got less ontological commitments, right? And this is one of the more, I think, robust arguments for atheism is that we should prefer it because it has less commitments ontologically, and it, maybe it can explain things as well as theism does. And I guess I would push back on that and, and say, no, it doesn't explain things as well as theism does. And simplicity is is good— uh, but it's not the only thing that we should consider. Now, I would also want to say, at the end of the day, theism is going to be simple in the most robust sense anyway because of things like divine simplicity and, and so on and so forth. But I think that that's – I think to to your point, Matt, of this being a greater metaphysical project, simplicity, good. I want to acknowledge that. But again, if we're just trying to keep our ontology uh, as to like sort of a stripped-down bare minimum and we're – trying to get rid of anything that can't be reduced to physics or chemistry, we're probably going to wind up with a radically incoherent worldview. And once I started to realize that, uh, that's when I really began. I I didn't go there. I I just I couldn't go there. Right. Uh, And that's when I decided uh, I needed to to reconsider things. In his recent discussion with Alex O'Connor, who has a very large following on YouTube, uh, atheist uh, sort of apologist, if you want to put it that way, he probably wouldn't. He'll actually be on the show in a couple of weeks debating Trent Horn. So again, if you're watching and you haven't subscribed, subscribe so you don't miss that. But in his recent conversation with Dr. William Lane Craig, Craig says something really interesting at the end, and it sounds a lot like what you're saying. He says, you know, a big part of apologetics is showing somebody a price tag they aren't willing to agree with. Do you know what I mean? It's like, okay, yeah, you can be an atheist, but here's what you must accept when you when you buy atheism, if you were. And it sounds like that's kind of what you're saying. Like, no free will, no universals, no truth. The self may not exist. Like, there, there's a series of things that you, you also have to buy into. And so if you're unwilling to pay that, right. then rather than just sort of being flippant about it and just saying, I'm an atheist, you have to then try to do the hard work of then reconciling those things that you don't want to deny. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that. And I think there's certain things that people won't want to buy. And then I think there's certain things that you just can't buy. So people probably won't want to buy moral nihilism, for example. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't think anybody really wants to buy into nihilism. But I think that's probably what you're going to be left with, right, on this type of worldview. Again, unless you're like a Platonist or you kind of venture yeah. into to theism light. But certainly from the broadly reductionist, mechanistic worldview. Um, and a lot I, of – there are. are right there are so you probably don't want to buy that maybe you could kind of you know bite the bullet dig your heels in and you could just try and live with i don't think you could ever live consistently with it on a kind of performative level you're always going to live as if it's the case but yeah there's no straightforward contradiction there but if you're going to deny something like essentialism or teleology right that everything is just a construct of the mind in terms of essences well then the mind itself is going to have to be a construct of the mind and then we're just kind of into this vicious mm-hmm. circularity well did the mind cause itself so i think i think there's mm-hmm. some things that you just can't even buy in this worldview whether you would want to or not mm-hmm. that's a really that's a really good point let's just maybe if you don't mind spend a minute talking about uh, why objective morality has to have god as its sort of ontological basis i know you talked about platonism which is another position somebody could propose but at least on atheism it seems really difficult uh to ground objective morality and i don't i don't mean to kind of put it in a crass sort of way but if atheism is true then certain other dogmatic truths follow necessarily right that 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 we have been to quote dr craig again coughed into existence by a blind cosmic process that didn't have us in mind Uh, uh, you know, cosmologists tell us that what we are to face in the future is an inevitable heat death. 
Uh, who, who was it that spoke about that in his excellent book, The Time Traveler? H.G. Wells depicts that in a fic- fictitious way really powerfully. And so you could say, okay, from that vantage point of a universe in ruins, looking back, you know, if you were to say, if the Big Bang never had have occurred, would it have mattered or not? And the answer seems to be no, because everything kind of comes out in the wash. You know, we're just sort of these sort of primates that have evolved somewhat. We have, you know, delusions of moral grandeur. But at the end of the day, it's like, I don't know how you can't end up being a sort of like Roskolnikov character from Crime and Punishment or what's his name? Uh, Ivan from, from the Brothers Karamazov, where it's like, yeah, like if God does not exist, all things are, are permissible. Do you agree with that? Or do you think that's the, the, the theist straw manning the atheist? I, I think, no, I think it's certainly applicable to uh, various um again, broadly mechanistic, reductionist worldviews. I think the potential plausible escape hatch, if you're an atheist, is trying to jump into something like yeah. Platonism. But I think that's going to have its own unique set of problems. So what I would say is that once we kind of unpack what the moral realm is and what the good is, so people talk about moral values and duties. I like the classic tradition. I like to talk about the good, right? Mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. think that that's just – it's a better – way of thinking about what the good is. And the good, at least in some sense, is a functional concept, right? It's the attainment of an end. It's something that perfects us as the kind of beings we are. Mm. Now, once you have that and you have rationality in place where people can um, kind of perceive things in a realm of concepts over and above the physical facts and choose between various conceptual alternatives to either move towards their objective flourishing or away from their objective flourishing, well, now we have moral agency, right? And that's only going to really apply to beings that are rational by nature. So to me, it seems like if we want to have a really robust account of our moral experience, if you want to, if you want to honor our moral experience and not deny it, we're going to need both, again, essentialism, that there really are essences in the world, substantial forms. Like there really is something like humanity, for example, instantiated in Pat Flynn or being participated by Pat Flynn. And we're going to need teleology. So we need essences and aims, right? Things that really exist that are pointed at or directed to an effect or a range of effects that when accomplished really completes or perfects that thing as the kind of thing that it is. I would say at a minimum, you're going to need that commitment. And then where God comes in is as an explanation of those twin pillars of essentialism and teleology. And so you could do, I think, a lot of moral work, as like Aristotle did, for example, just by thinking about essences and aims. But to get an ultimate explanation for that, I think theism is going to be your best go. Mm -hmm. Just to back up a bit here, Jacob Hubbard just asked the question, can someone please define objective morality? Would you mind doing that? Yeah, so objective just means mind independent, right? As opposed, if something is subjective, then it's just kind of my interior fancy, right? So Matt is an object of reality. He exists. Even if I were to disintegrate, Matt would still be there. So when we affirm an objective moral realm, it's that it's me discovering something about the moral fabric, right? And then trying to come into harmony with it rather than me just inventing it or projecting it. Right. Okay, very good. Um, what are some... Uh, arguments you made for atheism during this time that we haven't discussed yet? Um, You know, uh, the funny thing is, is I I wasn't really making many arguments because for me, it's kind of my own process. Hmm. So I was never really public about this stuff. And even now, you know, I've been called kind of a Catholic apologist and because I talk about the Catholic faith a lot. But I I, I, for me, it was never an apologetic project. It was it was a project of explanations. I want explanations for things. Um, and I think I mean that sincerely. So I never felt like a, 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 a strong need to kind of like publicly defend atheism. I remember I took some swipes at religion here and there, you know, kind of in passing on some of my content. But it was never, a, you know, something that was at the top of my mind. Like, I got to get atheism out there. That just mm-hmm. wasn't it. And even now, you know, I, I, I whether or not people would consider me apologist, I'll leave to them. For me, it's always been a metaphysical project, right? of one of seeking ultimate explanations. So where I was w- or what I would have said would it de- would depend on where I was at the time, right? And the closer I, I got towards probing the, the kind of deeper metaphysical commitments of atheism, the shakier my commitment to that became, mm-hmm. if that mm-hmm. makes sense, uh, to right. the point where I realized that this this can't be right. This can't be true. What, what and was, now I'm going to... 
I beg your mm -hmm. pardon. I was going to say, what was the main thing? You know, you say, I think there was a series of things that you were like, I just can't accept this or this, this isn't right. Uh, but was there one thing in particular that you're like, okay, game over? Yeah, consciousness is a big one, right? Explain so that to us then. Yeah. So let's think about what, what, you know, consciousness, you know, kind of is and just it's, it's kind of, you know, immediate uh, phenomenon. Um, it, it's something that is, well, we, we have an awareness. That's one aspect of it, right? We're, we're not only aware, but at least for us, we're aware of the fact that we're aware. So there's almost like a self-transparency here in consciousness. It's also teleological. It's aimed at, at, at certain objects. We think about things, for example, right? And there seems to be a, a robust immaterial aspect of consciousness as well, is which is what we can get into. Um, so w once I kind of came across what's called the, the problem of the categorical gap, I thought this was, was a big issue. And, and, and that problem goes something like this, right? If you're committed to a very reductionist, physicalist worldview, you believe that whatever else reality is at bottom is some kind of like physical simple. Now, some atheists will commit to what those things are. Others won't, right? So some might say maybe it's just fermions and bosons or fundamental particles. Others might say we don't need to specify what the physical simple is, but it's something physical in the sense that it's it's not going to be conscious. It's not going to be aware. There's no teleology, et cetera, et cetera. It's just this kind of dumb physical object, right? W whatever it is. All right. Well, now we have now we have an issue, right? We have an issue of categories because on – in that sense, in that worldview, we're supposed to imagine that just given enough time and chance that we can somehow affect a profound qualitative change, right? That from unconsciousness, we get consciousness. From unawareness, we get awareness. Mm -hmm. From arguably multiplicity, we get unity as well. So you have all these sort of immense category shifts. And, and to me, the problem, I think, is ar well articulated through a, an analogy, right? It's, 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 the, it's the idea that if you just have enough white Lego blocks and enough time to assemble them, you'll somehow get a purple tower. Mm. And that just seems obviously false. Like time and chance isn't enough to affect the type of qualitative change, no matter how, how off, you know, no matter the number of combinatorial configurations we have, we don't have the categories on hand in this reductionist worldview to get the phenomena we're trying to explain, which is consciousness. And this is this is what leads a number of atheistic thinkers to be eliminativists. So this is something that that not just theists say, but atheists recognize as well. They're like, well, actually, yeah, that's that is a problem. So what's our solution? Well, it seems like you have two options here. You could either go back and re-examine your initial metaphysical commitments, or you could say, come hell or high water, I'm committed mm -hmm. to this worldview. And if this thing can't be explained, then we're going to explain it away. So consciousness doesn't exist, right? It's it's an illusion. Um, and of course, that invites a, a host of interesting problems like, well, if it's an illusion, who's in an illusion for, right? So you're still you, – you, you haven't really removed the problem. You just pushed it back a step. It doesn't seem like you can escape it. Um, and then other arguments for their immateriality for consciousness. Consciousness was a big one for me, Matt. Mm -hmm, that was mm -hmm. that that seemed like something that we couldn't deny, but also couldn't adequately explain on this worldview. And then on a personal level, uh, morality and love. You know, you know, I have a wife that I love dearly, and like just to think, like, yeah, this is just some chemical sputtering in my brain. Like, this is nothing more mm -hmm. substantial than that. The love I have for my kids. Uh, there's there's no transcendent significance to this at all. It's just pure uh, fitness utility. That's all that that is, right? Um, that that wasn't so much a, an intellectual thing as it was just a very deep intuitive thing. Like this just doesn't seem right. And then coupled with the intellectual difficulties, I was fairly happy to abandon the worldview at that point. Okay, why don't we just take the next 10 minutes to explain how you went from where you were there to Catholicism, because I want to spend a great deal of time. We've got some excellent questions coming here in here on the live stream that, that I want to eventually get to. Easy so, ones, I hope. Uh, yeah, well, we'll see. Uh, but, you know, questioning atheism, deciding not to be an atheist is not to decide to be a, a Christian or a Catholic, obviously. So how did you how did you then begin to make the trek to Christianity? Right. So i uh, still kind of on the hunt, trying to figure things out. So I wanted to just go back and study all those great thinkers that I was either lightly acquainted with. You know, you, when you're going through like intro to philosophy courses, of course, you're exposed to people like Plato and stuff like that. But it's it's always 
pretty superficial, or maybe I just wasn't paying very close attention, right? Um, so I'm like, all right, let's 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 go back and let's study some of these great thinkers. And uh, the more I did of Plato, Aristotle, Boethius, and then obviously Aquinas as kind of the poster child of the great theistic, classical theistic project, the more convinced I became that this worldview was the correct worldview. And I took a pretty, once I, once I, you know, kind of discovered the tradition of natural theology, right, of the metaphysical arguments for God, that just immediately absorbed my interest, hmm. right? The idea that we could, through reason alone, just from the armchair, by thinking about the metaphysical structure of the world, um, get to an uncaused, purely actual being from which we can derive all the divine attributes and arrive at classical theism. And the more I studied that, you know, it's one of those things like you, you study it at first and and you're like, okay, well, maybe there's there's something here, and but I need to do more studying. The deeper and deeper I went into it, the more convinced I, I became that, that these arguments in a general sense, in a broad sense, are correct. It doesn't mean I like all of the arguments or every argument for God. Uh, but definitely those in the great Thomistic tradition, um, I think, are right. I think they're good so far as they go, and they convince me that, that yeah, classical theism is the right worldview. And then, you know, from there, that has a sort of winnowing effect on religion, right? So, like, if this is true, then some religion is at least possibly true, mm -hmm. right? But not all religions are possibly true because there's certain conclusions we reach – through natural theology, through arguments for God, that would be incompatible with certain religious commitments, right? So I think we can, through philosophy, know that God is perfectly good, that God is, is one, eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, all these things. Um, so polytheism is out. Also, God is radically transcendent. Pantheism is out. So any, any of those commitments probably aren't going to work. And I think we can also even argue that God is love, um, so it really kind of seems to converge on or hint at Christianity, right? I don't want to say that there's that that's the yeah, only option. Sure, sure, sure. But but, but it it hints at it. It yeah, points at it. That's good. And for the sake of this discussion, I won't make you make the bridge between sort of a, a general classical theism to Christianity. Maybe we'll get there in the in the comments section. Uh, were you familiar with arguments for God's existence, such as those of Dr. William Lane Craig or Plantinga, prior to discovering? Aquinas, etc. Um, I had a a very passing familiarity. I kind of stumbled, like once I stumbled upon just the idea of natural theology in general. I kind of went out looking for all of the ones that I could find. Gotcha. And so, like the Kalam argument, for example, I've had a I've had an interesting relationship, kind of on and off again with the Kalam argument. Now, yeah. now I'm on right after hmm. the, the some of the recent stuff with. Uh, Alex Proust and yeah. Robert Coons on yeah. Grim Reaper paradoxes. Now I'm like, yeah, I think this is, I think Maybe this is a good argument. This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, like I think it's a really good argument. Proust's latest book on uh, Infinity and Paradox was. Has was, Ed Fazer commented on that? Not that I know of. That'll be interesting. Um, I would love to, to hear about that. Obviously, Ed was a big influence of mine, right? So he's one of those contemporary thinkers that, that really helped me along on this. Was, uh, obviously, well. obviously, he's with Thomas in that the Kalam argument can't work philosophically right. so that's yes. why i'm interested to see if he would have something to say on that i would i would like his comments i mean i'm i'm on with it now right yeah. it seems like if you're it, causal finitism is true which is which is a powerful conclusion um because then then you've just secured the i think the critical premise to the kalam argument right um so but anyways for most of my journey i kind of like i think it might be good but i'm not sure or like maybe it gets to a stalemate or something like that so it was really the the more robust uh thomistic metaphysical arguments that that moved me would you feel comfortable then laying one out for us yeah sure yeah and let me which, think of the kind of which of aquinas's ways would you like to just kind of give us a summary of and why you find it convincing or would you rather give a summary of something else no can i give a summary of a pat flynn hybrid yeah Let's do a Pat Aquinas Flynn slash so, Pat Flynn. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I'll just I'll just blend kind of insights from Aquinas and, and others on this one. So, yeah. uh, a couple different steps to this argument. Let me give the kind of general outline, and we can just unpack it. So, the first step would be to show that there has to be at least one uncaused or unconditioned reality in the collection of everything in the totality of reality. Then the next step would be to show that whatever else the thing is, it has to be a pure act of existing through itself. And that there can only be one of those things, right? 
And then the last step will be to show that it is purely and, and fully actual, right? It's automatically purely and fully actual. And I think once you get that, you can kind of unpack sure, the, the if you get that, the, But how do you get to the first point you made? Right. All right. So let's take the first one. Um, by Let's start with definitions. So conditioned reality. I like to use this terminology. I borrow this from Bernard Lonergan and, and mm -hmm. Robert Spitzer uh, because it's a, it's a broad notion of causality that can fit well with, uh, you know, any – even classical or quantum mechanics and stuff like that. So we don't have to worry about fitting it in with the scientific worldview. It, it accommodates it quite nicely. So a conditioned reality would be, be anything that exists only because certain conditions beyond itself were fulfilled, mm -hmm. right? Which enable it to be, right? So again, colloquially put, it's pretty close to just saying that's a caused reality, right? So something is dependent upon conditions beyond itself being fulfilled for its existence. So for me, for example, I depend on the conditions of my having procreative parents, even though I try not to think about that too much. I depend on the Earth's atmosphere, electromagnetism, the strong force. So there's conditions that brought me into existence. There's conditions that sustain me in existence. Like I am shot through with contingency. Contingency is another word we can kind of slip in here, right? Mm -hmm. I am, but I could not have been, and so on and so forth. I'm dependent, dependent. Right. And then the question is, could could everything be like that? Could could all of reality, whatever that is, the totality of reality, my friend Josh Rasmussen likes to yes. call it the blob of reality. Right. Could all of that be a conditioned reality? And I think the answer is no. And here's why. Because if all of reality were even collective or let's put it this way, if there weren't at least one unconditioned reality, in all of reality, if there weren't at least one uncaused reality in all of reality, then all of reality would itself be at least collectively a conditioned reality, which is really to say that all of reality would itself be dependent upon conditions beyond itself in order to exist. And now we've hit a real snag because yeah. outside of the totality of reality, there's, there's nothing, right? So we're really saying on the hypothesis that there is no unconditioned reality – that the totality of reality being collectively a conditioned reality not only does not have its conditions for existence fulfilled, but in principle could not have its conditions for existence fulfilled, which really means that it's nothing because any conditioned reality that doesn't have its conditions for existence fulfilled is just something that never came to exist. It's nothing, right? So that's a complete disjunctive, mm -hmm. right? So like if that hypothesis is false, then the other must be true. And the other is that there must at be at least one, at least maybe more, but at least one unconditioned reality in the totality of reality. So I'll pause there if we want to. Yeah, that's that's really compelling. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, I became familiar with Josh's work through Cameron Batuzzi, and I really like I really like that. That that that, that just makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, it's it's good. And now there's a couple just some objections, right, that might be worth considering. Let's well, what it. about an infinite you know, a uh, collection or infinite series. And I think that this, this isn't going to work for a couple of reasons. One is because an infinite collection of dependency is still just dependent, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, let's go back to the analogy of stacking things, right? An infinite number of white Lego blocks is still white. Um, now people might argue that this is a composition fallacy, but I would say for composition fallacies, mm -hmm. we have to consider categories on hand, right? So while it's true that just because every brick in a wall is two pounds the whole wall isn't two pounds um that's true it would be a composition fallacy to fallacy to infer otherwise with that category such as weight but it wouldn't be if we focus on the category of color mm. for example right and what i want to argue is dependency or conditionedness is more like color than weight right but we can we can maybe formalize it or push it a little bit further right so let's just imagine that we have thing a which is dependent on thing B, which is dependent on thing C, and so on and so on and so on ad infinitum, right? Well, now what we're really doing with this is we're just kind of like infinitely frustrating thing A from ever coming to exist, mm -hmm. right? Because there's always one more set of conditions that we can go before thing A ever comes to be. So we're really just infinitely deferring thing A from ever existing at all. So I think those are those are a couple ways that we can show that even if there were an actual infinite number of things, we would still need at least one independent, unconditioned thing outside of it or within it, wherever we want to place it, to explain the the dependency relations of all those things. 
When Josh Rasmussen talks about, you know, all of reality as a sort of the blob of everything, is he talking about that in a static singular moment or is he talking about it over the course of history? So things Josh, that did exist and no longer do. For example. Yeah, Josh. And let me give him a shout out. He's a awesome dude, friend of mine. He's been on my show a number of times. And, and he approaches this, I think, in a way, in a similar way to Father Robert Spitzer, who's also a hidden gem when it comes mm -hmm. to metaphysics. And Josh wants to say, and, and Josh, please correct me if I'm wrong on this and I misrepresent you, but I think he would want to say it probably doesn't matter mm -hmm. for the sake of this argument. Um, same thing, like it doesn't matter if we think of this as like a collection of individual stuff um, or just like one thing in itself either. Like it's not it's not going to matter for the sake of this argument. So we can actually put that debate mm -hmm. entirely aside. And I think that's a wise strategy, right? If we can sidestep issues that aren't entirely relevant then and we don't need to get into it, then why even bother? Okay. But okay. but in fact, fact check me on that. It's been a while since Josh has an excellent book called How Reason Can Can Lead to God, where he kind of yeah. spends a little bit more time on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this is this is excellent. We, what I thought we could do now is take some questions from those who are watching the live stream now. And so I would just invite everybody who's watching, if you've got a question for Pat, feel free to throw it up, and uh, I'll, I'll ask him. And then maybe we can just wrap up with some concluding thoughts, Pat. Was there, was there anything else you wanted to say before we get to some questions? Um, so if, if anybody wants to kind of see a more detailed exposition of that, I just for this special occasion, I actually sent you the text of the document before, Matt. I kind of I'm working on a larger philosophical book project, and I took a section of it where I develop this type of argument in a little bit more detail. Okay. And uh, it's free if anybody wants it. So well, it's, I'll tell you um, what, Pat, why don't you after this shoot me the link? I'll put it at the top of the show notes, and that way people can click on that as soon as this video is done and check that out. Sweet. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be awesome. And then the other thing I will say is if I don't know the answer to your question, I'm just going to say, I don't know. But I'll try always, and always a good policy. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and recommend some resources that might be able to, to answer it. Yep. Yep. Okay. So we have one question here. Let's see. I'll throw it up on the screen here. I think it's Javier. Is that how you say it? Javier. Uh, he says, I think us Christians should focus on evangelizing the indifferent, not atheists. I think the real, I think in the real world, there's more people who just don't care than strict atheists or agnostics. What, what would you say to him? I would say, I, I, man, I appreciate that. And, and I think that that is the hardest. I think that is the hardest job to do. Uh, at, least, at least when I'm uh, in conversation with atheists, I have a, a lot of atheist friends. I mean, it's, it's just kind of like my history, right? Like I myself was atheist. So I kind of, you kind of gravitate around uh, people who are like-minded. So I still have great many friends that are that are atheist or agnostic and you know those that are that are interested and, and passionate you can you can make progress and i have made friends mm -hmm. i think with a lot of my, my uh conversations i've had with them um but those who are indifferent and sadly i have to say a number of my family members are this way as well mm -hmm. matt i don't have a very good answer to that this is uh, I, i'm sorry that the first question is already an i don't know except for that the indifferentism is I think the hardest thing to break through, and yeah. it's something that I that I personally struggle with. I mean, but I you know what's interesting to, is this Javier mm -hmm. bloke is saying that we should evangelize the indifferent, not the atheist. So it sounds like uh, you and I maybe would disagree with that. I would definitely disagree with that because it sounds like what we're focusing on here is it's difficult to evangelize the indifferent. But he's saying right. we should do that and not atheists. But I mean, the one thing atheists are usually not. Well, th this is a broad statement, but at least if they're vocal about their atheism, they're definitely not indifferent about it. The practical atheist is the one, the one who's usually indifferent and difficult to reach. It's the toughest project in the world. Now, I found that sometimes that people can seem indifferent and they might not actually be indifferent. So it's worth trying to, you know, uh, try and have a conversation or even just invite people to church. I mean, that's something that we've done. We found just sometimes people are just waiting for an invitation and we're just too shy to make one mm -hmm. so you know just be willing to try otherwise i agree with you matt um now again there's people are atheists and become atheists for many different reasons um so it's it's hard to to kind of it, it would be foolish to lump them all in one category yeah. but certainly i've found that i've had many more productive conversations with atheists at least in person online is sometimes a different story um than not now, we've got a super chat here, so I'm obliged to, to have them on the screen here. This is John Erickson. This is a difficult question here, Pat, so uh, feel free to punt to Athanasius or somebody. He says, I'd love to hear Pat's explanation of the Trinity. Good luck, Pat. Oh, man. Yeah, so what, you know, the Trinity, 
One thing that I think that that's helpful, especially if we're trying to reconcile the Trinity with divine simplicity, which is, uh, you know, one of the great projects, right? One of the great projects. How can we say that God is absolutely simple, yet there are three individual acts of unrestricted understanding in God, right? Well, I think we can at least start with a rough analogy of our own consciousness. And I think I think our own consciousness actually provides a number of clues about God. And I, I just want to be very careful. All analogies are going to break down with God eventually, but we can at least get started with clues. Because there's something cool about our own consciousness in the sense that it is a, it is a really simple reality, like we were saying. It's, it's simple, it's transparent to itself, and it can unify other realities that would otherwise exclude each other. Now let me unpack that a little bit. Um, the boundaries of a square, metaphysically, this is something that Robert Spitzer is big on, exclude the boundaries of a circle, right? Mm -hmm. That's why you can't have a square circle. So, so the law of non-contradiction isn't just a principle of thought. It's a principle of being. It's an ontological principle uh, as well. But what's cool is consciousness is so simple that I can hold together different concepts like square and circle in this unified, simple reality, right? Well, now we could start to see how maybe the mind of God might be able to do something similar. But with the Trinity, here's, here's kind of something that comes, I think, out of the existentialist to mystic tradition that's at least a helpful way of, of thinking about that. It's one reality consciousness, but there's relations of opposition mm -hmm. in the sense that I am aware of my awareness. I am both experiencer and experienced, right? So now we have this sort of rela this relation of opposition with a reality that is absolutely simple. So the Trinity in this tradition is, has sometimes been thought of, and I don't want to make any hard commitments here, and I'm like just trying to pray that I stay in the lanes of orthodoxy, right? <laughs> if I veer out, call me out on it, please. The idea, God's intellect, right, and his understanding of himself, the idea mm -hmm. of himself, right? So the intellect, the intellect's understanding of himself and the shared love and understanding that are shared between them. We can start to see how you could have both divine simplicity and the Trinity. Yeah. Now, there's people who make stronger arguments, like my friend Chris Tomaszewski. He's done a couple of podcasts recently uh, where he would say, you're going to need divine simplicity to make sense of the Trinity. Hmm. And he gives he gives a number of interesting arguments that are probably um, – I would probably not do great service to even try and trot those out now, but I would check him out. He's yeah, got no, some that, good stuff on this. That's a really good. Uh, that's a really good beginning explanation there. It's important to point out too, and I know you know this, Pat, for, but for our listeners, that there were people in the history of Christianity, like Hugh of Saint Victor, for example, who thought you could prove the Trinity philosophically. Aquinas denies that. He says you can show that it's not contrary to reason, but the reason we know God is triune is because God himself has revealed it. And so I like what you said there. You know, you said this can help us get to, you know, the beginning of understanding. But uh, I think that's that's obviously important. Well, let, let me say one more quick thing about that, if you don't mind, because Please. I don't know if I'm fully committed to this, but it's an interesting thought, right, that if we can get love from divine simplicity, which I think we can, and whatever is in God is God. That means God is love. Can we get relations from love, or mm -hmm. do we need well, this relations was, this was love? Saint, this is actually Hugh of St. Victor's argument, believe it or not. It's yeah. a, it, sounds oh, like a mo I, it sounds like a modern one that kind of originated accidentally in Christopher West or something, but it is actually yeah, I, something I think that people have tried. So I'm not, I'm not actually familiar with that. So yeah. I, I, I borrowed this from more contemporary thinkers I've heard okay. this from. Um, so may, maybe there's yeah, a path Yeah, so the argument is something know, like not, this, right? I'm not right? going to make a commitment, but yeah, maybe there's a path. Uh -huh. Tell me if, if this is kind of the track you're on here. Like, for love to exist, there needs to be three things. The one who loves, the one who is loved, the love that they share. If mm -hmm. God is love, then it would follow that he's sort of three in one somehow. That kind of thing? That's yeah. way better stated than the direction I was going, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, but it, yeah, well, okay. Interesting stuff. All right, let's see what else we've got here from people. Lots of good questions. Okay, Zelda Power. Always love to hear from from a, from somebody like Zelda. Says, I love Zelda. what's your favorite Zelda? Real quick. Um, so I love the latest Breath of the Wild. That I am not time. cool enough to to fully be able to immerse myself in it. It is absolutely beautiful, but I'm not geeky enough to like really understand it. I get into it for about 15 minutes. I want to love it, and then I find myself I'm just lost. Yeah, I just played through it with my, my oldest son, and it was just such a good experience because, like, it just reminded me, like, I was his age playing Zelda yeah. at one point, and I now, just, I just now played, we're playing. Yeah. I just played the remake of it 
on the Switch. That was really yeah. cool. Really beautiful. Yeah, I, we have that one too. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, let's get down to this question though. Because <laughs> Zelda would be pretty pissed if all we did was speak about Zelda <laughs> instead of the question he had. He's like, what are the best objections to the moral argument for God's existence? Can you think of? Um, yeah, Platonism, I think. Um, I think trying to, if it, it, it depends what moral argument you're making, right? Mm-hmm. So what is what is the, the moral argument? The standard, uh, I guess, okay. apologetic argument uh, would be that if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Mm-hmm. The objective moral values and duties do exist. And I guess you could challenge that first premise by adopting a, a Platonism, mm-hmm. right? So then the project would then be trying to show that there's an issue with Platonism, and then you're going to get into the debates of extreme realism and moderate realism and, and all that sort of thing. So if I were, if you were to say, Pat, attack the moral, the traditional moral argument, I would probably try and go to Platonism. Yeah, it's difficult to make sense of duties, isn't it, on moral Platonism, since a duty seems to imply a command given, like, and a command seems to be something that can only exist if there are two minds, one to give, one to receive. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that. I mean, what duty do I have to an abstract object supervening on my character? It just seems a little strange, right? Um, you, you would at least have kind of essentialism. So I guess the way you could maybe salvage duties there would be to kind of run a, a traditional natural law argument that, like, if you want what is really good for you, then you should you should mm-hmm. follow the dictates of the natural law or whatever. But you do want that. There's a sort of categorical imperative there because we can't but help but want that right that's our nature to will what is good for us well, let, i think yeah, and then there's just there's just causal causal issues with platonism right how is this interaction taking place and it, it just and that's where i would say like god is a much simpler and more elegant theory like if you're if you're willing to commit to platonism i really think you should just commit to theism at that point so the na- the naturalist objection might run something like this and i'm i'm, I'm not going to offer it as strongly as i could because I, I haven't really fully immersed myself in it but it would be something like you know we we have been evolutionarily wired to choose what is beneficial to our nature and to want what is beneficial to those around us because if we weren't evolutionary wired evolutionarily wired in that way we would have never made it this far as a species as we have so it seems to us that rape is wrong, uh, and it seems you know maybe these are moral fictions at the end of the day, but they're bloody useful ones in order to keep the species progressing. Right. So yeah, what I would say to that is that evolution by itself doesn't settle the issue one way or another because why couldn't we have evolved to discover these moral obligations and duties, right? Why should we assume that we've just evolved to invent them? Well, the, it seems like the only reason we should assume the latter is if we're assuming atheism or naturalism oh, is true. That's very interesting, right? Yeah. So yeah, I would just say evolution doesn't doesn't tilt it one way or another. We need some deeper metaphysical reasons. I've never or, thought of that, Pat. Thanks for sharing that with me. Sure, sure. happy to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because then you don't have to get into the debate of whether evolution really can fully account for our moral behavior, which is a weedy debate. Mm-hmm. Um, I would just say it just, it's just almost irrelevant or question-begging. David K. seems to be, we have many evangelical viewers, and I, I love all of you. You're so welcome here. David says, what advice would you give to someone who wants to learn about the Catholic faith coming from a Protestant background? It's so confusing to know where to start. Yeah, that's a really good question. So let me kind of issue another story here. So my wife, she's a convert. She was never baptized. Uh, She grew up in a house that was half atheist and half kind of new age, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she kind of grew up with a lot of, she's, she's, you know, I guess, anti-Catholic stereotypes. So as I'm like moving through this and, and, you know, thinking like, hey, there might be actually something to Christianity here. My wife kind of famously between us said, okay, I'll consider this with you, but no way in hell am I ever becoming Catholic. Um, now she's, now she's Catholic. She was just Mm -hmm. confirmed, confirmed last year. Um, so for her, one thing that really helped her that she found beautiful and that just, just helped to explain the Catholic faith really well was Bishop Robert Barron's Catholicism series. Yeah. She really thought that that, um, just was a wonderful introduction to Catholicism. Um, so I would I would certainly check that out. Obviously, Matt Frad and Pites with Aquinas is a wonderful resource. And then if I could offer another book, um, Father Thomas Joseph White has a oh, wonderful book. I got it right here. Look, ready? Boom. That is ex- I didn't even know that. I couldn't be more convenient. <laughs> 
Um, I really, that's, that's it's actually... It's an excellent book. I, yeah, The Light of Christ, An Introduction to Catholicism. I 100% agree with Pat. If, like, it's not philosophically dense, but it's certainly not light reading. It's not like academic, but it's not light reading. But if you're looking for something substantial, I would highly, highly recommend The Light of Christ, An Introduction to Catholicism. Go get it on Amazon right now. Right. Boom. Absolutely. And I tell you, yep. uh, we're going to find a way. If you, if you can't, if you can't aff- afford it, write to me at assistant at mattfrad.com and I'll buy it for you and send it to you. Now, wow. I said that, but now I'm like, oh, there's a thousand people who are going to write to me. But I guess the, hopefully y'all aren't uh, immoral people. So the one person who, if you'd like me to buy that for you, I'll buy it, ship it to your address. But uh, yeah, it's a great book. It's such a good book. And he's just got such a wonderful way of explaining the faith. Again, and it's, it hits that sweet spot between accessibility and, and rigor. Yeah. Um, I was so impressed by his just because it's I mean, like, look, if somebody were to say, like, give me Catholicism in a <sighs> nutshell, look, I'd be like, let me just let me just quote something I read this morning that blew me away as far as like, you know, when you think of the, the papacy, when you think of the magisterium, that sounds like a really daunting thing. Right. Right. To try and understand. Um, but he's, he explains it so well here. Let's see. Oh, golly, now I'm not going to be able to find it. It was something to the effect of, here it is. Here's what infallibility means. So infallibility, big, scary, prickly word, lots of objections to it. But listen to this. Infallibility means this. If God has revealed himself, then what he has revealed is true. And the church can come to know over time in a definitive way what God has revealed. Like the alternative is God has revealed himself to us. What he has revealed is true. But you can't ever be really sure about right. what that is. And I think that's evidenced in our Protestant brothers and sisters. You've got some who hold to baptismal regeneration, some who say it's only a symbol. You've got the Quakers who don't even practice baptism. Uh, I mean, that's like like John 3, 5. Unless you're born of water and spirit, you will not enter into eternal life. That was understood universally by the church fathers to refer to baptism. This is the the normative means by which we are saved. And you look to Protestantism and you just find confusion. And yes. it's not okay. I mean, Cameron Bertuzzi, who I'm debating with this Sunday on Patreon, I mean, he's like, I think uh, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm almost certain that he wants to make the case for annihilationism. So the point, the idea that hell doesn't exist. So the idea is like you come at the scriptures and you don't have tradition. You can end up with any number of things. But the beautiful thing about Christianity, God has revealed something to us so that we can know it and be sure in our knowledge of it. You know. Right, and and that that just made sense to me. Like, if God's going to go through the trouble, not like it's any trouble. I love God, that. Yeah, to, that's a good way to, to put it. Though. It, yeah, to revealing himself. <laughs> why, why then let us be so confused? Yes. It seems like he would want some type of knowing device for us to make mm-hmm. sure that we at least have the essentials right. And also, it doesn't seem like God would ask the impossible of people. And if 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 you know what Christianity came down to was just was the Bible itself or Scripture itself. I mean, just taking in the historical context that of how many people were illiterate for, you know, a significant portion of that history and how even to get a Bible would have been enormously cost prohibitive. It just seems, if not impossible, utterly unreasonable. And I just don't see why God would ask that of people. But if he gave us a church, right, and the magisterium, those problems are gone. We, we kind of escape those, I think, epistemological dilemmas of trying to interpret a book, and, and no book can be self-interpreting or tell you what should be infallibly included in the book, or even how to apply the lessons and consequences of Scripture to a modern day. That itself was, I think, a, another huge challenge. So yeah, for me, it just seemed really like it, it, it really just kind of had to be the, the Catholic Church. And I say that with, with all due respect. I have so much respect for my Protestant uh, brothers and sisters and Prot- so many Protestant philosophers and theologians that certainly helped me and continue to help me mm-hmm. and inspire me. Me too, me too. Um, but yeah, I just didn't even see Protestantism as um, a lot, even being a live option. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Here's an excellent and honest question. I'm always a big fan of these. Siegfried says, what advice would you give to someone who is being besieged with doubts about the faith? I know that rationally God exists, but emotionally I'm having lots of trouble fighting my doubts. Yeah, that is that is true, right? Um, we're all besieged, and I think if, if, if we're all being honest, we all have those feelings, right? It's, it's for many different reasons. A lot of it comes down to our own suffering. 
um, you know, look out into the world or the, or the suffering of others. Um, so I can say what I do and then, um, and you can try it out. Um, so I, I try to stick to the Catholic basics, right? First and foremost, prayer, daily prayer every single day, whether you feel like doing it or not. Um, individual prayer and we have family prayer. Also availing myself of the sacraments. Uh, we try to get to daily mass, get to frequent confession, all of that. So, so making sure that we're keeping uh, the fundamentals fundamental, um, and make sure and, and doing that first, right? Because it, it, faith really is is a gift. It's a, it's a, it's a grace. Um, and so, while you know removing intellectual obstacles and hurdles is important, so that way we can be receptive and responsive to it. Uh, I think we have to remember that that these supernatural virtues are supernatural. I also very much believe, and I think this is true for me, that that God will allow us to struggle and wrestle because there will be some outweighing benefit for us in doing that. And that outweighing benefit for me, I think, has been not just increased study, but increased prayer. I've increased my devotions in times of doubt and struggle. I've grown closer to God in intimate and important ways. Yeah. through my doubts and struggle. And I would say lean into that and, and realize that God can be delivering that outweighing good, that deeper relationship with him by allowing you to, to struggle and grapple sometimes. So that's that's how I typically handle it. And then just trusting too, you know, that, that virtue. I know that's hard to do when you're doubting, but trusting that God mm -hmm. will continue to carry you through. Yeah, um, I'd say two mm -hmm. two things just to piggyback off that. The first is what you're pretty much saying, and that's what like Blaise Pascal had to say in in uh, the Ponces. You know, after he kind of shares this um, this wager with us, and it sounds like Siegfried is on the side of okay, yeah, God exists. He's like, okay, then what? Like, what what do I do? Because I can't force myself to feel a certain way. I mean, that's interesting because there's an analogy there with marriage. I mean, there are certain times I feel a lot more affectionate to my wife than others. Sometimes I feel like almost no affection to her. Sometimes I feel angry at her, you know, but uh, I'm going to choose to love her or I should. If I don't, I, re I have to repent of that. And, and similarly, we're going to have feelings of affection and closeness to God at other times more so than another. But one of the things Pascal says is just what you said there, Pat. He's like, take you know, use holy water, receive the sacraments, do the things that faithful people do. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is sometimes when I feel like I'm being besieged by doubts, I mean, just the word there alone, besieged, indicates that there is a number of these doubts, right? That, that they're everywhere and they're all coming after you. Sometimes it's sort of like seagulls on a beach. You know, it's like it's, they seem a little scary, but if a child turns around and faces them, they go away. And it's sort of like, okay, besieged by doubts, then pick one. Pick one doubt, because it's very difficult to respond to a thousand half-baked doubts rising up in your consciousness. So go, okay, what's the thing that bothers me the most? Choose that one, and then really spend some time studying it, looking at the Christian response to that particular objection. And once you find, and I think you will find, that that response is um, sufficient, um, uh, you know, that, that would, I think, then give you confidence that these other doubts that appeared to you to be lesser could also be answered. That's a really good point. Um, I think that's something we've all faced too, where it just kind of, it all floods in at once and you get so overwhelmed, you don't even know where to begin. Yeah. Focus on one thing, drive it through. And and back to uh, Pascal, my uh, friend, Dr. Michael Rota has an excellent book called Taking Pascal's Wager. So maybe, maybe if you're not a theist or you're an ag agnostic or you're an atheist who's maybe considering things, uh, the point Matt said is is right. Like you can't just force yourself to believe something that you're not sure about. Like or that you think might not even be true. Like, I can't just force myself to believe that there's an elephant in the room right now. Like, I don't even know how I would do that. Um, but what you can do, and this is kind of how Dr. Rhoda formulates Pascal's wager, is if you think that it might be true, you can at least start a life of seeking, of sincere seeking. You don't have to force or fake belief, and you shouldn't do that anyways, because that's being insincere. You don't want to be insincere. But you can pray agnostic prayers. God, if there is a God, save my soul if I have a soul, right? You can start reading the Bible. You can start going to community groups, Bible studies. You know, if you're not Catholic, you can't take advantage of the sacraments yet, but you could go into an RCIA seeking. Um, so I would I would say that, definitely, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, Cameron Batuzzi just showed up. He said, just, just joining, did the countdown work? 
Uh, so for those who are interested, Cameron was kind enough to create that countdown for me, that two minute thing at the start. Um, one really great thing I'll say about Cameron, and this is something I, I want to be better at, is Cameron is like the king at creating the greatest looking YouTube channel ever. Have you seen it, Pat? Yeah, let me say hi to Cameron. Cameron was on my podcast probably like a year and a year and a half ago. I got it, Cameron. I want to I want to catch up. I want to chat with you again. It'd be it'd be awesome. But yeah, your podcast, all of it, your stuff is beautiful. But you he's got a photography background, right? He does. But one of the things I admire about Cameron is he's not like selfish and keeping all this knowledge to himself. I'll ask him any question. Oh, yeah, I'll do it for you. Oh, yeah, I, I'm happy to help. Like you know, like I paid him to create that countdown because he obviously spent a good chunk of time in it, but. But I think that's something like we can learn from is us YouTubers. Like you asked me, Pat, earlier about my setup here. I'm like, I'll give you all, all of it. Let me just tell you all of it. Like the idea that I'm going to keep sort of information to myself so that my channel can get better and others can't. I, I don't want to live like that. And I love that Cameron's not like that. He's a really, he's a good guy. You know, one thing that if I could just mention a, a quick aside, because, you know, I've done a lot of business in different industries like the fitness industry, and you get that attitude a lot, right, where people don't want to give away, mm -hmm. I guess, secrets or something because they're afraid, well, then he'll have an advantage and maybe I won't do as well. It's just kind of just very shielded attitude. But since I've um, kind of come into the, the broader Christian world, I've been just amazed at how willing people are to help e each other out in, in, in these in these little respects. And, mm. and that, that always says something to me because, you know, I was I would always get kind of frustrated of people not having that attitude. And it, it I guess it was a sign to me that that they're really bought in to the greater mission. Mm -hmm. Right. And that there's this there's this like, yes, we're all in this. We're all trying to help each other out to do what we think is important, which is evangelize. Well, Cameron just wrote back and he said, let's do it, Pat. So let's, uh, I'll shoot you his. If you don't have his email, Pat, Pat I'll give it to you and we can. Yeah, uh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Anyone else have any questions? We've got tons of comments. Um, here, here, here's, here, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say thanks for tuning in, everyone. This has been a lot of fun. This is super fun. We have 257 people watching right now. And those, awesome. those 257 people should bloody click that thumbs up sign and subscribe to help the channel. If you don't, you can still be here. Hey, Pat, real quick, what's your podcast called? We'll get to this at the end, it, but just real quick. Yes, it is called Humbly and Originally, The Pat Flynn Show. Awesome. That works. The Pat Flynn yeah. Show. Go check it the out. Pat the Pat Flynn, Flynn Show. Show. Oh, and should we mention, Matt, that I'm not the only Pat Flynn? I know we were Go for it, yeah. Yeah, so there's more than one. Interestingly enough, there's more than one Pat Flynn in on the internet world there's actually three pat flints i think i'm maybe the second most popular so the first most popular is the smart passive income pat flynn that's not this pat flynn he seems like a super cool guy but that's that's not me and i think some people might have thought that that was the pat flynn that was coming on your show so sorry if there's been a huge disappointment here actually you know what pat um, i don't think that i thought that as well but then as we started the video people were like oh great i loved his book on this so Okay. Maybe cool. you're more popular than I th you thought. I'm I'm the most popular Matt Frad only because I don't think there is another Matt Frad who exists. Actually, there is. He's in England. Mm -hmm. I said that, and then I realized, and I feel really sorry for him because you know that whenever he googles his name, he finds some guy who wrote a porn book, anti-porn <laughs> book, to be clear. <laughs> right. Here's a question from Ryan Pope. Great last name. What should Catholics say to atheists who seem very happy in their current state and don't see the need to pursue deeper truth? Yeah, I think that that's kind of comes down to indifferent indifferentism i guess again um i mean one thing you could try to do you know and you want to always try and be gentle and cordial in these things is just kind of probe those deeper commitments those deeper metaphysical commitments and the consequences that came out of them so certainly for me the the more clarity i got on what i would be committed to if this atheistic worldview was true um, had such enormous implications that I couldn't be comfortable with it anymore. And I just think that a lot of people uh, kind of live in a kind of like a practical or superficial atheism. They just, they aren't seeing it, right? And like, I know people that call themselves atheists that still believe in an afterlife and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Like they just, I guess they just haven't really engaged in a deeper philosophical project, which why would we expect that most people are doing that that anyways, right? A lot, maybe a lot of people who call themselves atheists just think I'm not a Christian, right? And certainly that's an impression that I've got. So I would start by asking questions, ask the deeper kind of fundamental questions. Hey, what do you, what do you think is, you know, at the bottom of everything? You know, what, where do you think, you know, where do you think explanations peter out? Do you yeah, think yeah. we have a soul? Do you think that there's life after death? 
Uh, do you think that that love is is you know something over and above just axons? I love how you I love how you put that. Where where do the questions peter out? That's how what Bishop mm-hmm. Robert Barron said. Like be more be more interesting, be more curious, not less. Right. Keep asking. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and sometimes that's you know that might be enough just to just to spark you know a conversation and to get them thinking like okay maybe maybe I don't want to commit to this position. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joey Puvel or Puvel or Puvel or Puvel or Puvel or Puvel or Joey says, is the sublime nature of Scripture a good piece of evidence to evangelize atheists? And if so, how will we go about sharing Scripture with an atheist? Let, let, me, begi- I, let me begin. <laughs> I just want to say no. <laughs> I was going to say it never impressed me. <laughs> That's right. I got it. So this is what, this is what the, the Muslims do. Like, look how beautiful this is written. Nothing uh, humans could write could ever be this beautiful. You're like, yeah, but it can because Shakespeare <laughs> well, and Pushkin. The, the funny thing, uh, Matt, for me was it was kind of the opposite, and then it became the opposite again. Let me explain what I mean by that. The first time I picked up the Bible and I read, I think it was, I think it was uh, Mark, um, Previous that I was reading a lot of Rumi and a lot of beautiful poems. I got them like, this reads like crap, mm-hmm. right? Like this is just not. This is a, like I was expecting something different. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like I was, I was expecting. This, like, oh, this was Augustine. Deep. Augustine said the same thing. I mean, he was a Manichae heretic prior to picking up the scriptures and was totally unimpressed by it. Yeah. So it, it did not impress me until later, as I started, you know, exploring the. I guess the deeper justification for Christianity, especially historically, that these weren't meant to be poems, mm-hmm, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And that it really just seems like that these guys were just kind of reporting the facts um, in a very straightforward, almost exceedingly terse way, mm-hmm. which then kind of you know points in some ways to a certain degree of reliability. So what what at first was actually off-putting uh, to me, or I guess I don't even want to say it was off-putting. I wasn't off-put by it. I just wasn't wowed by it. Mm-hmm. Um, it certainly didn't convert me on the spot. It's interesting that that later, you know, kind of feeds into, I guess, a piece of evidence for Christianity as a whole. But yeah, in general, I would say when I was a skeptic, if you would have just had me read the Bible or qu- even quoted scripture to me, it would have yeah. meant not. It would have meant nothing. Yeah, yeah. Put yourself in. Put yourself. Uh, suppose you were debating a Muslim and he started quoting the Quran at you. How how helpful would that be? You know. Anyway, but of course. You know, maybe the maybe the question was meant to be a little more broad, and I've misunderstood it. And if I have, I apologize, Joey. But clearly, there's a lot of fulfilled prophecies that we can trace through Scripture. Typology is very impressive. But I would say that the atheist that you're dialoguing with would have to show some sort of interest in that before delving into it. Otherwise, you might just be white noise. Here's a very lovely question, a very honest question. Ryan says, I am in the process of conversion, but my liberal wife is very much struggling with my transition. And I wonder if you have thoughts on living in the same house with her but also how I can be a witness. Yeah, my wife was quite uh, liberal as well. Um, you have to, you have to, is she, is she Christian? Can we get clarification <clears throat> on that? Is she? Yeah, it, it, Brian, if you're, if you're uh, still there, tell us if your wife is Christian, if you don't mind. I get the sense that she's not though. Right. So if she isn't, then I think you have to focus on the fundamentals. And, and I think this is, I think this is true in general in evangelization and apologetics. If you focus on, I guess the downstream issues, um, say contraception or something like that, you're probably not going to ever convert anybody, right? You're just, you're just not, people have their commitments there. Um, but if you focus on the existence of God and the unconditional love that God has for all of us and the resurrection, Mm -hmm. and you can get them committed to that, then it's systems thinking, I think in a way. And then especially once, if you can get the commitment to change to Catholicism, then once that sort of initial worldview has changed, it tends to mm-hmm. to adjust everything else downstream. Yeah, that's a good. From it. That's a good point. It's a, it's a it, it's it's there's less to jump. If I can go from atheism to God's existence, then whatever else I have to jump to from that is going to be less of a stretch. All right. So, um, so if, even for my wife, just uh, for example, real quick, I mean, she just really readjusted a lot of her views on everything after becoming Catholic because mm-hmm. she thought that the Catholic Church, uh, you know, is indefectible in faith, morals, and sacraments, right? She came to that position. And once you come to that position, he, you kind of have to r- everything. R- r- Ryan just responded to your question. He said she sort of has a universal concept of Christ as God, maybe not necessarily God, personal faith, God. As nature 
Yeah. But one thing I'd like to kind of piggyback on what you said that I thought was really excellent is we don't have to get people to buy the entire thing at once. Um, it's not like I need to have somebody convert to Catholicism or nothing. And that's kind of what you were saying as well. Like, well, maybe, maybe God exists. Like, that's a possibility. Yeah, you know. Or maybe they say, okay, I believe in God, I believe in Christ, but I'm still not, you know, I, I disagree with the church's stance on homosexual marriage. Okay, like, we can talk about that now, or, or we don't have to. Um, here's what the church teaches, and, and, and you disagree, and, you know, you're allowed to disagree, and we can discuss this. Um, but, the, yeah, would you agree with that? Well, absolutely. And, you know, even for me, it's not like... I cleaned up my entire act before I converted, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're complex people are, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it wasn't until after I, I came and I won't get into the gory details, but I lived a, a pretty sinful life, right? Before I really converted. And there was a lot of stuff that was not in line with church teaching about my life. I mean, a lot of stuff. Um, but it was stuff that by God's grace, after I got those fundamental initial commitments, you know, down, um, sorted, were sorted out, you uh, know, you know, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, this, sorry, did I cut you off? No, no, not. Too this is really good. This point by Quirt, Quirtley, I think he says, he says with the popularity of people like Jordan Peterson, I think, I think it shows the richness of the Bible is striking despite being written so long ago. It's not a matter of the mere aesthetics, though. I think that's a really great point, and I wish I had thought of that when I was responding because, yeah, I think there's a lot of atheists who have given Jordan Peterson a hearing and like, okay, so God doesn't exist uh, and the scriptures aren't inspired or anything like that, but bloody hell, we can learn a lot from them. Um, and I think, so I think that is a really interesting point he brings up. Yeah, Peterson is interesting because he seems to serve as something of a bridge to Christianity for a lot of people. Um, and I think, you know, he's kind of even more, I haven't followed him too closely, but he seems to have kind of taken a lot of the new atheist audience away from the new atheists. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. And, and open them up to at least the possible, like open them up to, Hey, maybe there's more to religion than I was, than I was previously considering. Right. And, and maybe it's not as much as Catholics want to say, but there's at least more to it. And then that sort of receptivity there, that, that, that new openness, which might not have been possible if it wasn't Jordan Peterson, if you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Like if, if it was just like a Catholic priest making exactly. the argument or you or me, Matt, like yeah. they might have just immediately wanted nothing to do it because Peterson is not for, you know, since he's not a Catholic, so far as I know, yeah. he's kind of coming from a more secular perspective and, and you know, from like, I guess, evolutionary psychology or whatever else. Oh, man. This I think is... that's an interesting angle. We're getting right? so many beautiful comments right now. This this one lady says, Jordan Peterson brought me back to Christianity. Ryan, who we just heard from him a moment ago about his wife, he, he said, Jordan Peterson led me to Bishop Barron, which led me to a mystical experience. And then this oh, guy yeah. says, Peterson was also instrumental in my path to Christianity. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, what a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. Uh, and, and keep praying for him because uh, his, uh, again, I haven't followed it too closely, but he seems like he's had a really rough year. Yeah, I watched that uh, interview he had with his uh, daughter recently. It was really heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw that with Michaela. I, I, ha I haven't it's yet. Worth, I it's, worth, it's worth watching. He's been through absolute hell and back. I'm so grateful for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Pat, this has been super fun, and we have to do this more regular because you're such a bright guy, and you've got a great way of explaining things, and um, it's yeah been really helpful. Um, I want people to get connected with the excellent work that you're doing, so please tell us about you know not just the book, but the podcast, the video, however people can get in touch with you. Sure. I, well, first off, Matt, thank you. This has been an absolute blast. I would love to chat with you anytime. Sure. Thanks for everyone <laughs> tuning in. Uh, yeah, about me. The podcast is called The Pat Flynn Show. So like I said, it comes from a generalist perspective. So there's lots of stuff there, some fitness content on kettlebells. Every Friday, I do a segment called Philosophy Friday. I've actually just been going through the five ways with Dr. Gavin Kerr. He's, wow. he's really great on that stuff. Long episodes, though. There's like four two-hour episodes. So Fantastic. you have to strap in for that. I do Sunday School, where I interview awesome people like Matt Frad on Catholic faith and theology. So some interesting segments there. I think um, people watching this might enjoy. Um, yeah, my, I have a bunch of books out on fitness and the, the generalist book that I was talking about. They're all on, on Amazon. And then that the new one I'm working on, which um, really is uh, in a, a project of natural theology, I have a, a segment that, again, I'll send you the link if people just want to take a, a peek at that. And then my website is chroniclesofstrength.com. 
Mm-hmm. And do me a favor again, Pat, as soon as we're off, would you just do me a favor, shoot me an email with all those links and I will make sure they go at the top of the show notes. So if people are watching right now, they can give me five minutes or if you know, you're know you watching now, that after the fact, you'll, you'll see them all there. Awesome, dude. Absolutely. This has been fun. Thank you for telling us how you outgrew atheism. Absolute joy, Matt. Thanks for having me on. All right. See you to you and see you to everybody uh, out there. Thank you so much for being here. Please do me a favor and click that thumbs up button and the share button. That all helps the channel. Uh, It's great to have you here. Um, Let's see. What do we have coming up? On Monday, I do a big interview with Pat Madrid on Sola Scriptura. If you are a patron of Pints with Aquinas, you can watch my live debate with Cameron Batuzzi, who stopped in for a little bit. We're gonna we just we debated the the Eucharist last time, and on Sunday night we're gonna get together to debate Sola Scriptura. Cameron being a Protestant, me being a Catholic, but the two of us are quite friendly, and it's n- not adversarial or anything like that. So people have tended to enjoy it. All right, God bless everyone. See ya. <laughs>